It is the 1980s, a plague originating from an unknown source deep from within the heart of the Polish forest Darkwood is infecting its inhabitants. To protect the outside world, the government has contained the plague by isolating the inhabitants and sending in teams to investigate the source. You were on one such team, but things went wrong after an attack on your camp and you are now alone. Now you must find your way home or be consumed by the woods. One night in August 1975, a bright object of unknown origin was seen falling from the sky over the heart of the forest Darkwood. The infection began to spread fairly rapidly. The trees began to grow impossibly fast and thickly. Animals and people began to develop symptoms of unknown and incurable diseases. The Sector 3C village, which happened to be the closest village in the vicinity, was the first to be affected and attempts were made by the government to contain the disease, such as having infested livestock and houses burnt to the ground. Roads that allowed access to the heart of Darkwood were closed, but these barriers were then consumed by the growing forest. The forest began to form its own barriers. Many hundreds of square kilometers were encompassed and much of the surrounding landscape. The structure resembles a honeycomb. The surface of particular cells varies from 80 to as many as 360 square kilometers. The cells gradually divide into smaller ones. It can be assumed that with time, the forest will achieve a homogeneous form. The trees grow with remarkable regularity, forming walls with the average thickness of 50 meters. The distances between trunks are never higher than 10 centimeters. According to preliminary analysis, only 15% of the total volume consists of actual trees, although this figure is hard to verify. When seen from above, it became clear the forest was taking on a honeycomb-like structure, with thick walls of trees forming barriers and slowly dividing up the forest interior into smaller cells. Within these cells, the inhabitants of the wood were unable to leave and they became completely isolated. In order to continue monitoring the situation from ground level, the government built a series of tunnels beneath the ground to travel safely between the cells. By 1983, the village of Sector 3C had been on their own for a long time. Their fields had flooded and they were all beginning to slowly starve to death. After years of not seeing anyone from the outside world, they noticed groups of strange people appear in the forest carrying guns. These secret groups were sent in by the government to continue their research on the source and nature of the infection. To contain the infection and to reduce the risk posed to the outsiders by the increasing mental instability of the local inhabitants, any surviving villagers were not helped, and those that tried to use the tunnels to escape were shot. As the infection grew worse, so did the situation. The ever-growing roots of the forest, increasingly replacing the earth in which they grew, began to cause small local earthquakes and many of the tunnels began to collapse. Attempts to study the forest had limited success, but knowledge was gathered on electrical activity within the root system, on the shape-shifting properties of the fluid and patterns of forest growth, but the absolute cause and means to control the woods remained out of reach. The roots have made it impossible to dig further. Specialist tools will be needed if we are to go deeper. Observation. The roots of individual trees intertwined to create bundles, braids, with the thickness of 120 centimeters. The ones we analyzed always grow towards the northeast. Taking into account the results from the dig sites from other regions, we can assume that the bundles come together in sector zero. We have accumulated about five liters of the substance that flows through the roots. As expected, it has lost its shape-shifting abilities after being disconnected from the root, the stream to be exact. In 1987, the infection would at last come to an end when dark wood and much of the surrounding woodland caught fire and the mysterious infection ceased.
The being arrived in August 1975, most likely during the night, as a bright shining object that fell from the sky over the heart of the dark wood in Poland. We haven't slept again. Another madman came here at night, the second one this month. He jumped over the fence and tried to ram the door with his head. I shot him in the ass with the tranquilizer. Today we're going to transport him outside. Since that accursed tree appeared in the village, an increasing number of savages roam around hideouts. How do they know about us? They're psychos. They can barely talk. The villagers in our sector still have no clue what's going on. It's been 10 years or so. But when they lose it, all they need to do is go into the woods, put some mud on their face, and they come sniffing. Stefan told me that in the neighboring sector, the wild ones appear mainly in the vicinity of the hideout located near the tunnel entrance. I don't think it's a coincidence. Supposedly, the being is of extraterrestrial origins, but it's also possible that whatever fell from the sky could have interacted or caused a change in something that was already present in the dark wood. All that we know is the being made its home in a valley in the heart of the dark wood, surrounding itself in thick layers of tree roots. Before extending this root network across the region, marking the beginning of the plague only a few years later. Substance is described as a clear white fluid, which the being uses to grow, similar to the mycelium of a fungus. The being does not appear to have direct control over the substance, as it seemingly acts more autonomously like cells in a body. This is suggested by the paradox of the being beckoning, called being directly opposed by its own growth, preventing many inhabitants from reaching it. The talking tree is said to have grown extremely rapidly, even by the local standards, like a growth or a tumor, and blocked any further flow of survivors from reaching the being. The fluid has shape-shifting properties and can take on forms after it has been in contact with them. As long as the replicated object remains in contact with this network, it can regrow rapidly. This makes it nearly impossible to break down any part of the being's network for long. The being is seemingly incapable of direct speech and must either communicate through radio signals or through essence or infection-induced dreams or hallucinations. Heavily associated with light, the being is near incomprehensible to humans, and merely being close to it proves overwhelming. It is unknown why it wants people to come to it, or how it benefits from them sleeping at its roots, as these sleepers do not appear to get consumed by the being, and merely wisen until they die. But once they are in the valley, they are trapped. Even if they break free from its psychic control, the tunnels out of the valley are kept sealed by the being, so that people may come in, but they may never leave. The plague is the influence of the being, capable of infecting all living organisms. The symptoms tend to generally manifest in two main forms, mental and physical, but sometimes there may be a combination of symptoms. Corpses can become infected and will begin to take on a deformed appearance and may explode when touched. Physical deterioration forming the plague leads to the transformation of humans into chompers and dogs into huge dogs. The primary symptoms are as follows. Asymmetrical and unnatural body growth resulting in deformities, hair loss, splitting headaches, a scar appearing on the sagittal plane of the skull that gradually increases in size and length until it reaches the hip, with internal growth of large teeth. Eventually the host will become immobilized, whether through pain or deformities, and will go into a dormant state where they sleep until awoken, upon which time they undergo the full transformation and heighten aggression following the transformation. The transformation for dogs is less violent, with an increase in size and muscle mass, but sharing the similar symptoms of hair loss and increased aggression. This form of the plague does not appear to as greatly impact on the host's mind as the mental deterioration form of the plague does. The mental deterioration form of the plague leads to the transformation of humans into savages, with primary symptoms being obsessive compulsive behavior, such as drawing symbols or covering their faces with mud and sticks, auditory and visual hallucinations, insomnia and loss of appetite, loss of the ability to speak but not necessarily vocalize, heightened aggression, obsession with traveling home, loss of ability to write, loss of a sense of self-preservation, drive to consume mushrooms as well as wood and bark. And last but not least, 
ritualistic behavior. Savages appear to seek the companionship of other savages while isolating themselves from non-savages. They also appear to be under the direct control of the being due to their ritualistic behavior such as the careful creation of ritual sites consisting of circles and lines drawn in often repetitive patterns as well as tying people to trees and leaving them to be absorbed by the trees. One of these rituals is specifically designed to help facilitate the being's ability to create new creatures through its shape-shifting fluid. These sites will feature at least one human being, in addition to a number of other organisms such as lizards, mushrooms, crows, centipedes, or even other corpses. The exact method of inoculation is unclear, whether it is a completely supernatural phenomenon or spread by spores or some form of gas in the air is unknown. The outsiders certainly appear to believe that the infection is airborne as they wear hazard suits when outside of their hideouts and use oxygen tanks with notes from their research showing that the woods increase its volumetric output of some unknown substance by nearly fourfold at night. Now that we know the origins and the effects of the plague, we have to get into the story and characters behind it. You play as the protagonist, and very little is actually known about the protagonist, not even your name. The protagonist was a soldier who was likely a very skilled handyman. He had already been into the woods surrounding Darkwood five times before and was seemingly eager to return. You were bored of home life and you enjoyed sports. You were embittered by the news and would sometimes watch children's TV to distract yourself. The news was pure garbage, as always. I was only waiting for the sports to digest. We won two to one. I watched Plastishove Pimyetnik before going to sleep, boring life on leave. One week, I will walk into the woods. It will be my sixth time. This time we're going in from the west. The trip will be exceptionally long. We're taking one of the longest tunnels. It almost reaches to the last zone. Supposedly, it's starting to give under the pressure of the roots, but the job is urgent, so fuck safety. I have no idea how any of this is kept under wraps. Are those poor saps unaware of the fact that we're taking trips under their feet? Maybe they like it here so much, they don't really care? I wouldn't be surprised. The protagonist lived in a small flat in a large rundown apartment block, which he shared with his significant other and his dog, Zurek. He seemed to be a friendly and good-natured man who was on good terms with most people in his apartment block. This is also suggested by the kind demeanor of the traitor, his replica. In game, he displays heightened aggression and violence, typical of the effects of the plague, with which he is undoubtedly infected without his hazard suit. He appears callous, uncaring, and impatient with others and even himself often insulting or speaking cruelly of the locals in his journal, full of desperation to just get to the road home. On his last mission into the woods, his group were assigned to an urgent mission much deeper in the woods than he had ever been before. It is unknown what the purpose of the mission was, but it appeared to involve the collection of samples and measuring the electrical output of the root network in the region. It is also possible he might have been part of the seven strong teams sent to retrieve Maciek. Whatever the purpose of the mission, his camp was attacked and overcome by savages. He amongst three others were bound to trees to die, but he managed to escape, discarding his torn hazard suit for the clothes of a scarecrow and fleeing. Eventually he collapsed due to his injuries. After escaping the doctor, the protagonist, now infected, begins to follow the call of the being, backtracking the way he had fled. The traitor is a replica of the protagonist made by the clear substance. The traitor is compassionate and rational, likely displaying the protagonist's true personality prior to infection. He obviously cares deeply for the protagonist's well-being, helping him when he can, greeting him warmly, gestures which the protagonist does not return. He also shows relief on seeing the protagonist having survived the first night, and increasing concern as he moves deeper into the woods, even following him through to the swamp. He does not really appear to do anything outside of following the protagonist, his main desire being to keep the protagonist alive. His likely he recognizes what has happened and what he is. The circumstances surrounding his death are mysterious, but it happened no sooner than he had emerged from the underground entrance. His assailants were likely either the three or the protagonist himself. The wolf is a replica of a hunter and one of his trophies, a sadistic and vengeful individual. The wolf desires only two things, to see the villagers suffer and the pretty lady. It is not clear if he is fully aware that he is a replica, only that he knows his appearance deserves others and his cause 
outs the village to shun him. He has a deep enmity with the chicken lady, whom he believes is all that is stopping him from reaching the pretty lady. Pretty lady has been inferred to be the wife of the hunter, both of whom wore silver wedding rings. But interestingly, the ring of the pretty ladies is actually found in a pile of blankets on which the chicken lady herself was sleeping on, making it a possibility the chicken lady herself might have been the hunter's wife, and the wolf's deep hatred of the chicken lady and desire for the pretty lady might even stem out of the hunter's desire for an extramarital affair prior to the hunter's death. It is ambiguous whether the wolf is truly part wolf as trophies of both dogs and wolves are found within the hunter's lodge. There is also a possible link to Beric and the photo of a wolf-like creature standing over a man found in the lodge. The wolf has a playful side to him, hidden under several layers of sadism, rage, self-pity, and vengefulness. He is generous to those who help him and appears to hold a genuine sense of camaraderie with the protagonist if he chooses to side with him, potentially offering him multiple gifts and is eager to help him reach the doctor if played right. He is extremely vengeful of betrayed, however, pursuing the player through to the swamp even if it doesn't serve his own interests and challenging him to an intentionally difficult fight just to punish him. He seems to have an animosity towards the doctor, yet at the same time must have interacted with him on at least neutral grounds, as he knows that the doctor took the key off the protagonist when he first met him. He also appears to hate Piotrick for unknown reasons, but as Piotrick mentions he once owned a small plastic chick, possible he is somehow associated with the chicken lady. Despite calling the protagonist meat and claiming to dislike played, contaminated flesh, he leaves the healthy villagers alone and instead focuses his cannibalistic desires solely on the pretty lady. His dedication is not the bloodlust of a hungry carnivore looking for sustenance, but the sick obsession of a psychopath with no regard for human life, who is willing to kill even if he doesn't get what he wants. The musician is a polite and well-meaning child who lived with his parents in the old woods. His mother was a violinist and also used to work in the fields. He shared a strong bond with his mother, following in her footsteps to be a musician and take delight in the idea that he might one day help her work in the fields. It is unknown what his father did, but it is known he used to beat the musician, but the musician still loved him. At some point, the small family began to succumb to the physical deterioration form of the plague. His parents became immobilized and almost unable to speak, but the musician didn't, believing his parents to be angry with him as they would no longer hear how sad he was. The musician ran away from home. Possibly prior to this, the musician hoped to be admitted into the church basement, but was denied entry. Due to his physical deterioration, the musician had been to the doctor at some point, who had taken pity on him and provided and in a small wooden mask knowing that it was the only thing he could do. The village themselves shunned the musician for his deformities. One day he saw the pretty lady, a woman deformed by the plague just like him, and he saw her as the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, someone he saw as suffering. In an attempt to comfort her, he would play his violin for her. The pretty lady is a relative of the chicken lady. She's a mutated, gigantic woman hidden under a blanket in the locked room of the chicken lady's house. Her ghastly wheezing can be heard from even outside her room, and her figure can be seen twisting and churning under the blanket if one carefully looks into her room through the barricaded window. Her mental and physical deterioration due to the plague was rapid. She became violent and developed cannibalistic desires. As a result, for her own safety and those around her, she had her arms and legs chained. Despite the infection, she still cares for her sister and is self-conscious of her appearance. The chicken lady is a strange old woman living with her chickens in the chicken house found within the village. She seems to dislike musician, calling him a creature. She cares deeply for both of her siblings and is distraught at the idea of losing either of them. Due to the cannibalistic drive that the plague has instilled in her sister, she cannot untie her and as a result is very frustrated when she catches the musician trying to free her. Despite the irritation she shows towards the boy and the bliss ending, she will adopt the musician and care for him and his family. The doctor was once a well-meaning and good-hearted man, now turned alcoholic, desperate, and violent by the plague. He lived in the woods with his wife and daughter before the plague, working to keep the local village healthy and sometimes driving to the Sector 3C village to help them too. When the plague began to appear, his daughter and wife were likely sent away for their own safety, but the doctor stayed behind to try to help. Eventually, the Sector 3C village woods became so overgrown that he could no longer reach Sector 3C. None of his remedies would stop the physical and mental deterioration of his patients, however. At one point, he attempted to build a sanctuary for the locals by isolating certain individuals below the ground. This, in turn, failed. Operating 
moving out of his own house, the doctor had to take to tying down his more violent patients to prevent them from harming him or others. The child of one of those patients can still be found in the trailer outside in the process of becoming a chomper and in huge pain. The doctor's house is surrounded by graves of dead patients. He's a scientific individual who uses deductive reasoning, documenting everything he can with a camera and notes. His knowledge of the outsiders is limited. He doesn't know about the purpose of the oven gas, for example, but the doctor is aware of the outsider presence in the woods. He knows they can come and go as freely as they please. While he is stuck surrounded by the dead, dying and sick, unable to return home to his family, and unable to help anyone at all where he is. And for this reason, he loathes the protagonist when he first meets him. Sadly for the doctor, it is very possible there was an attempted rescue mission to retrieve him, but the helicopter crashed on route for unknown reasons. Piotrek is an eccentric tinkerer. He has a mess pile of junk in his yard which he dreams of turning into a spaceship, and he suffers insomnia over his obsession with space travel. His relation to the other inhabitants is unclear. He mentions his father, but not who he was. Curiously, his workshop is said to smell strongly of rosin, a substance often used to treat string instruments like violins. He also says at one point he owned a plastic chick, which he melted into a moon, possibly associating himself with the chicken lady, who is known to have given these out to close family. If he was related to the chicken lady in some form, it might explain why the wolf man hates him, but this may well be due to Pietrick's innocent delusional thinking, which opposes to Wolfman's harsh and cynical view of the world he lives in. Piotrick himself doesn't appear to be enemies with anyone, his only wish is to go to space. It is possible this obsession might be brought on by the being. If his ship is completed, it will be found crashed now much closer to the heart of the woods. Differently to the others though, he never mentions wanting to go home, merely he wanted to reach the stars. The cripple is an older gentleman with hazy eyes, who sits dormant in his wheelchair. He's lost his legs from the knee down. He seems to be the only person left in town. The rest have died or become a part of the talking tree. He loved his village dearly, and the presence of the talking tree, a reminder of those long dead, is tortured him. He's the last surviving inhabitant of the village, kept there only by his inability to walk, but he survives by catching fish in the flooded streets. He, unlike most, is aware that the call of the being is a trick, and that the road home is not that at all. Quote, the road to madness is what it is. End quote. As he's already home where he is, even so, he's still unable to resist the call if the path is cleared. The snail is a character that likely used to be human. Its desire is for boots and its discussion of what it thinks is human, which is brought up when it discusses how ugly the protagonist is for a human, suggests that it has some concept of what it's like to be one. This is likely given the area around it is scattered with writhing and mutating figures attached to small snail shells. Also, the snail has a human skull in its head and a hand that is sticking out from its body, supporting this hypothesis. The snail had presumably been living alone for some time. He lived in what was once a pretty wood clearing before the flood arrived. He appeared to be quite a clever and innovative individual, compiling a map where objects of value were stored in the junkyard completing crosswords at a rapid rate, as well as attempting to record the sound of the being using the tapes he had found and try to figure out what it was and where it was coming from. He theorized the voice had to be coming from the nearby radio tower, even though it had been knocked down for some years previously. His death, starving to death in his bed, must have been a painful one. He would eventually be reincarnated multiple times by the forest, as a mix of his last meal and himself, a snail and a man. The largest and most complete of these is the snail himself, formed atop the roof of the house which then collapsed under his weight when he first tried to move. He appears to be quite cowardly, hiding from the protagonist. He's fully under the being's control by the time the protagonist meets him, constantly mentioning a female voice calling him, drawing him towards the heart of the woods, and is completely oblivious to the fact that he is not human. Mushroom Granny is a replica of an old woman who once lived in the Sector 3C village. Granny was a kindly old lady who loved her daughter and seven grandchildren all dearly. She was a prolific smoker and a talented painter, and her favorite subject was flowers. She comes across as rather stern, with a more no-nonsense attitude. She treats others in the strict manner one might treat a child. When her daughter left with four of the youngest grandchildren with her, she was sad and but stayed where she was. But it was too much for her when the three were banished and their father presumably killed. And despite the fact that she could barely walk, she made her way out in the swamps in search of her daughter and was never seen again. Mushroom Granny is the same old woman, but from the night of when the thieves first broke into the basement. Her entire house and part of the surrounding village was also replicated in this way. She has no memory of the three being banished or their father being harmed. 
but acknowledges her daughter is gone, but her legs are too bad to fall over. She does not recognize Marchinet, as the boy would have been much younger at the last time she saw him. The elephants are a family of four. They're dressed in full, protective hazmat suits, reminiscent of the World War II era, with breathing hoses and oxygen tanks. Their strange appearance created by the mass is likely the reason for their nicknames, as a Polish-made MUA mask is often nicknamed Elephant due to its design. Their survivalist, paranoid, controlling, and extremely religious mother and her four young children. Shortly after the fields first became flooded, and starvation began to set in. The elephant mother left the Sector 3C village and took her four youngest children with her. They moved into a house in the swamp which they reinforced with a wall of junk and barbed wire. At some point, the oldest son came upon a shed, once used by the outsiders nearby, and brought back journal on their studies of the woods, which a mother interpreted as evil scripture. For unknown reasons, he then died, and his body was left in the shed. The three younger children live under the control of their mother. Marcinic was one of the these children, and later on he would run away, seeking out his grandmother. Despite her harsh and controlling behavior, the elephant mother clearly loved her children. She was a fierce survivor and somewhat of a shut-in, who forbidden her children from going outside, talking to strangers, or breathing any of the contaminated air. She herself argues that said air is the cause of the mutations of all the other inhabitants of the region. It is revealed that the mother of the elephants is the paranoid daughter of Mushroom Granny and the wife of the thief. This also means that she is the mother of the three. They are the three of her seven sons. One of her sons is dead and his decomposing corpse is sitting in the old shed. The three have the appearance of tall, robed figures wearing masks and covered in branches. The taller, central figure carries a sack which, as stated by the protagonist, reeks of mushrooms. The three are never seen talking, as communication is done via gestures or written letters. The three are the thieves mentioned by the cripple. This may be evidenced by a strange attachment, almost reverence, towards the talking tree, the entity containing all the dead villagers, on whom the thieves brought hunger. Furthermore, they are the lost sons of an elephant family. They follow their father instead of their mother upon their parents' separation. Based on dialogue with the cripple when showing him a photo of three boys, the three might be the three sons of the thief that stayed behind with him in the village. According to the cripple, they were banished from the swamp village and roamed the swamp as half-savages. The cripple also mentions that sometimes he hears footsteps and the bells chiming. While close to the three, the protagonists may hear the chiming of bells. The three have an affection for the talking tree. It's probably because the tree is an amalgamation of people who they know and care for. When the three walk past the cripple's house towards the tree, or back from the tree, is when the cripple hears footsteps and little bells chiming. The three are also the children of the elephant's mother and follow their father upon separation of their parents. The talking tree is a horrific amalgamate of the villagers from the night the thieves broke into the basement. Some are the thieves, some are those trapped outside. One of them is a cow that was locked in the basement, connected directly to the stream of clear fluid. It can regenerate any part of itself almost instantaneously. One of the villagers, at least, is self-aware and can interact with the protagonist. This is presumably the same individual who thanks the protagonist for sparing them if they aren't burned down. The talking tree is seemingly able to use radios for influence and control the environment around them. Finally, we have the bike man, who is an alcoholic middle-aged man, very competent at cycling large bags of goods through the woods. The bike man just likes to drink beer and have a good time. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say about him. <laughs> Before we get into the main story, I'd like to briefly touch on replicas and the substance, as you probably heard me mention both of those quite a few times. As mentioned previously, one of the properties of the being is a clear substance, which it can control, and runs as a stream primarily through a network of roots. This fluid has shape-shifting capabilities and can grow new organisms by using dead or immobilized organisms as a template, the original often being overgrown with rootlets. The new organisms the replicas are often noted to be imperfect imitations of the original, with solid inanimate objects often appearing to have hidden, bubbled surfaces as well as being softer and more mintable than would be expected, while moving living entities tend to become merged with other objects around them, both organic and inorganic. Quite often, replicas are paler in appearance and sometimes retain the mind and memories of the original counterpart, and are capable of acting independently of the being, and even appear to be unaffected by its culture. 
called, with a notable exception of the snail. Replicas are not always mobile and may be incomplete, forming snapshots of particular times. This seems to occur when the fluid does not have sufficient time to form a template from the host, with a notable exception with the mushroom granny. Examples of replicas are wolfman, traitor, mushroom granny, snail, talking tree, man in the tunnel with a soft bullet and weird cross, the entire house of mushroom granny and the surrounding glade, centipedes, swampers, human spiders, and banshees, the tunneling man, and in the swamp, there are numerous times where you can see replicas that are in the process of forming. They appear as white, clouded, and partial forms, often surrounded by mushrooms. The savages and villagers upon the road home and man in the village sector 3 see in 85% of the trees. The wolfman is a replica of a huntsman whose lodge was in the old woods merged with a trophy of either a wolf or a dog. Evidence for this comes in the form of the wedding ring upon his hand, and the man found in case and rootlets in the hunter's lodge. The other evidence is that he is clearly a fusion of two creatures, a man and a canid. The plague distorts and deforms what is already there in living creatures. It does not cause them to become more like another creature in such a symmetrical and natural fashion. The wolfman also clearly shares memories with that of the hunter, such as a love of collecting trophies, firearms, and for the pretty lady who wears an identical ring to the man in the hunter's lodge. The traitor is a replica of the protagonist, formed during the time he was tied up to the tree in his hazard suit before the prologue. The hazard suit helmet is a literal part of him as a substance did not differentiate between a living and inorganic tissue. Evidence for the traitor being a replica of the protagonist is strong from his familiar appearance, similar height, the most defining clues being the key to the Tunnel 21 in his journal, which are both clearly imperfect replicas compared side by side with the protagonist's own eye. Items. The doctor also remarks in the prologue on first finding the protagonist that he's carrying on him only a key and only a journal. Like the mushroom granny, he's observed to smell strongly of mushrooms and have paper white skin. The mushroom granny's counterpart's entire house can still be found within the village. These replicas can be inferred to have occurred on the night the father of the tree attempted to raid the basement. As can be determined from the conversations the replica villagers have outside, the mushroom granny's own reactions also indicate that she believes she is living at this time, as when presented with a picture of the three as children, she remarks that all they have left is their father, as well as not recognizing Marchinek, who would have been much younger at the time, and when shown a picture of the elephant mother, she will say she would have gone looking for her, but her legs prevent her from leaving the house, whereas in the village, the cripple will remark that the original granny did indeed leave the village. Like the trader, she is remarked to have paper white skin and gums, and if eaten by the protagonist, she is found to have no bones. The snails are a replica of man who lived within the cottage, whose corpse can be found entwined in roots within, and whose diary states he had taken to eat in snails shortly before his death by starvation. A strange clear replica key can be found on him growing out of the palm of his hand. The talking tree is a replica of the starving village, and from its dialogue it can be gauged to be a conglomerate consisting of both individuals who managed to lock themselves in the basement, including a cow, and those who were locked out. This connection to the substance being made particularly clear when the protagonist accidentally breaks an arm of one of the conglomerate, only for it to reform before his eyes, a property it retains as it remains connected to the stream. The man in the tunnel with the soft bullet and weird cross is a replica of the man who died much closer to the entrance to the swamp. His original body can be found there. He is noted to be attached to the floor and have an inhuman voice that doesn't sound quite right. He's also lying in a stream of the substance and his bones are soft and instead of blood he bleeds substance. And lastly, but most importantly of all, are the trees themselves, with only 15% of the woods being actual trees. Apart from replicating organisms, another property of the substance is that it seemingly has electrical properties, and as an actively controlled part of the being, it can be used to control radio waves. As is suggested by the radio tower's interior being completely overgrown with roots, and the numerous occasions where the being is seen to communicate through this means. In early September 1987, a group of outsiders were located at one of their camps close to Sector Zero. Studies appeared to be ongoing. To the west of the camp, they dug pits to access the tree roots and attach electrodes. The camp was attacked by savages and overwhelmed. Three individuals wearing hazard suits were tied to trees by the savages, a strange ritual they often performed. A lone boot found by itself nearby suggests a struggle. At least one of the individuals tied to the tree was alive at the time. 
this happened to be the protagonist. It's unclear how long they were trapped there, but during this time, the woods sensed the protagonist, and then its unusual shape-shifting abilities of the fluid substance that flows between the trees came into play, incapable of differentiating between different objects, the woods began to duplicate the trap protagonist and this imperfect replica with a hazard suit helmet grow as part of its body. This replica being the traitor, somehow the protagonist was able to break free from his biting, possibly badly wounding himself in the process as indicated by the bloody rope and shreds of his hazard suit that were left behind. And his viewfinder was smashed in, badly wounded. From perhaps both his beating at the hands of the savages and his escape. For unknown reasons, the protagonist discarded his hazard suit and swapped out his clothes for those of Scarecrow on the field beside the camp. He then fled, badly injured, trying to escape the swamp. He managed to reach as far as the old woods before collapsing. The doctor found him and brought him back to his home, where he injected him with an unknown substance, which is strongly implied to be the essence protagonist undergoes a dramatic deterioration in the mental health, but when he comes to, after being beaten by the doctor for information, he had lost all memory of how he had gotten where he was from his camp, and after he breaks free, he immediately begins to hallucinate, first imagining a radio becoming a man with dials for eyes, then imagining a dead man is taunting him, and finally witnessing a mob of black chompers breaking into and storming the house. The dial-eyed man is the first instance what is a possible dream since the protagonist is under the effect of the essence at this point. A man who appears to be connected to several power cables slowly repeats a number. This number is the combination of the northernmost room's door where a man, possibly Janik, is confined. If the protagonist returns to the dialogue man after wandering a bit across the room with the cages, he will instead find an ordinary radio again. This is one of the many situations in Darkwood suggesting that the protagonist's senses may not be reliable. It is speculated by many that the mob of black chompers that the protagonist saw were actually the villagers come seeking revenge for the doctor failing to be able to save them. On at least one other occasion, the protagonist hallucinated a human as a black chomper, so it's not out of the question. During the ransacking of the doctor's house, the protagonist somehow managed to end up outside, lying in the forest, weak and confused. The traitor finally caught up with him, helping him to his feet and escorting him to the first hideout of chapter one. The protagonist is now infected by the plague and is unknowingly under the woods control. He begins to backtrack the way he had come believing this is the way home, not knowing that the road home is actually the last room to the heart of the woods where the being lives. Eventually, the protagonist gets through the tunnel 21 and returns to the swamp and then eventually to sector 0 to where the being resides. Here, he begins to hallucinate once more, believing himself to at least have escaped the woods and his home once more. Depending on how hard the player themselves have fallen to this illusion, the protagonist there either falls victim to the being and goes to sleep, eventually to die, or he realizes the horrific truth and breaks free from the mind control. Breaking free of the hallucination, the protagonist finds that he's crawled through an organic tunnel which has sealed itself behind him, and he is stripped off his clothes. He is trapped within a deep valley, completely made up of roots and dead trees, trapping him within and offering no chance of escape. The protagonist may then confront and question the being, but it offers no answers. During his investigation of the surroundings, the protagonist will then stumble upon another outsider, one he recognizes, Machiek, a sleeping soldier carrying nothing but a flamethrower wrapped in prayer beads. Taking this flamethrower after finding Machiek for it, the protagonist will then proceed to burn down the being, killing it and everyone trapped in the valley with it, including himself. Fire spreads, burning much of the surrounding forest over the next few days. At last, the delusions, voices, and whispers stop, and anyone surviving can now at long last walk free as the first helicopters appear overhead. If you stayed for the entire video and found yourself enjoying it, leave a like and comment some theories you may have or some hypotheses. I want to give a major shout out to um, Al Cal for putting together a fantastic lore section on Steam and basically piecing together everything I said here. Whatever wasn't used from Al Cal was picked from the Darkwood Wiki and Reddit and several other sources. If you like what you saw, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Kavetis, signing off.